reading today is Daniel chapter 10, or sorry, Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 to 10. Now, the sermon today is actually going to be from Daniel chapter 11, verse 2, to the end of the book, which is chapter 12, verse 13. But that's a lot of reading. Um, it would take me about 20 minutes to read it out loud. Um, quicker if you're reading it to yourself. So I encourage you to read it yourself. Um, at home. This is part of Daniel's final vision and um, so uh, it's good to, to read the whole thing and, and you'll have read the whole book of Daniel then if you've been coming to these services and reading along so read along um, but today we're going to read a section of that and I will preach on other parts of it and read them as I preach okay so um, this is Daniel chapter 12 verses 1 to 10 at that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. There will be a time of distress such as has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, roll up and seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end. Many will go here and there to increase knowledge. Then I, Daniel, looked, and there before me stood two others, one on this bank of the river and one on the opposite bank. One of them said to the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river, How long will it be before these astonishing things are fulfilled? The man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river lifted his right hand and his left hand towards heaven, and I heard him swear by him who lives forever, saying, It will be for a time, times and half a time, when the power of the holy people has been finally broken, all these things will be completed. I heard, but I did not understand. So I asked, My Lord, what will the outcome of all this be? He replied, Go your way, Daniel, because the words are rolled up and sealed until the time of the end. Many will be purified, made spotless and refined, but the wicked will continue to be wicked. None of the wicked will understand, but those who are wise will understand. So, let us pray for guidance and for understanding. Lord, we thank you for your word. We pray that you'd help us to hear what you're saying to us today here through your word. Help us to see how it is relevant for our lives. Help us to understand it. Help us to remember it and reflect on it. Help me, Lord, to preach a faithful message and to speak that truth in love. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is heavy going. I know it is. Um, there is a passage in Genesis where um, Jacob wrestles with God. Is anybody familiar with that story? So Jacob tricked his brother Esau, his older brother. He robbed him of his inheritance and he robbed him of his father's blessing and um, Esau wanted to kill Jacob, and so Jacob ran away for years. And then he was coming back home, and he knew Esau was coming, so he sent out his family and, and everyone ahead of him. And he hung back, preparing to meet his brother, thinking that gifts and things would appease his brother. And so Jacob's there alone one night, and it's a big day in the morning, so he's going to meet his brother who, for all he knew, all he knew might still want to kill him. And a man appeared in Jacob's camp and wrestled with him until morning. And as they were wrestling, it, it dawned on Jacob that this was no ordinary man. This was in fact God he was wrestling with. And he clung on to him and refused to let go until he received a blessing. And that's how Jacob and his descendants got a new name, Israel. It means he strives or he wrestles with God. 
sometimes reading the Bible can feel like that. Some passages take some wrestling. But God is worth wrestling with because the wrestling changes us. So in the case of difficult passages, I encourage you to be like Jacob and to keep wrestling until you get your blessing. Because God is worth it. So this is the last sermon in our series on Daniel. The first half of Daniel might seem easier. Chapters 1 to 6, it's the bit that makes it into Sunday school material and children's Bibles, Daniel in the lion's den and the fiery furnace and all that. But the, the last half has, the second half has, has confused many people. But we need to remember that this is all one book and that there are themes in this book that run throughout it. And while the visions and the prophecy of the second half might seem weird, remember that these things have been present throughout the book. This is a book about worshipping and staying faithful to God in a strange and hostile world. And that theme was present at the beginning and it's still here at the end. This is a book about the brutality of empire, the greedy, violent kingdoms of this world, and the sovereignty, the true reign of God. And that theme runs throughout, and we see it here at the end too. Today we're looking at a message delivered to Daniel in his final years, he's an old man now, about the future of his people, and it gets dark. There lay ahead a time when the beasts of empire would seem to exercise their brutality unchecked and unrestrained. And the faithful of God's people, instead of being delivered like Daniel and his friends from, the, from their punishment in the fiery furnace and the lion's den, instead of being delivered, the people of God would go to their death at the hands of tyrants. But at the end of this darkness there would be light. There would be rescue and resurrection. There would be glory and everlasting life for the faithful, but it's, it's a hard road ahead. Chapter 11 of Daniel contains a history of the fall of the Persian Empire and the rise and fall of Alexander the Great and the division of his empire among his four generals. We read verses 2 to 4 of chapter 11. Now then I tell you the truth, three more kings will arise in Persia and then a fourth who will be far richer than all the others. When he has gained power by his wealth, he will stir up everyone against the kingdom of Greece. Then a mighty king will arise who will rule with great power and, and do as he pleases. After he has arisen, his empire will be broken up and parceled out towards the four winds of heaven. It will not go to his descendants, nor will it have the power he exercised, because his empire will be uprooted and given to others. So that mighty king referred to in verses 3 and 4 is Alexander the Great. And by the age of 30, he had created an empire spanning from Greece to India. And he acted as he pleased and was never defeated in battle. But while he was only 32, he died. And his kingdom was divided amongst four of his generals. And then from verses 5 to 20, we're told about the conflict and the rivalry between two kingdoms that formed out of the division of Alexander's empire. The text refers to them as the north and the south, which, which the history books know as the Seleucid, a kingdom, that's the north, and the Ptolemaic kingdom, that's the south. And Israel was caught up in the tug of war between those two powerful rival kingdoms. The north is called the north because it was north of Israel. Um, it was based in Syria. And the south is Egypt, which is south of Israel. And you get a lot of detail about this conflict between the Ptolemies and the Seleucids here, and their schemes and their battles. The thing is, though, for us, this is history. But for Daniel, this was all in the future. Verses 21 to 35 take a closer look at one of these kings in particular. Verse 21 calls him a contemptible person who has not been given the honour of royalty. But in Daniel, we've already met this man. History knows him as Antiochus IV or Antiochus Epiphanes. That's the name that he took himself, Epiphanes, which means God manifest. 
On the stage of world history, this man is not such a big deal. But the people of God, to the people of God, he was a terror. I want to read verses 31 to 34 of chapter 11. His armed forces will rise up to desecrate the temple fortress and will abolish the daily sacrifice. Then they will set up the abomination that causes desolation. With flattery he will corrupt those who have violated the covenant. But the people who know their God will firmly resist him. Those who are wise will instruct many, though for a time they will fall by the sword or be burned or captured or plundered. When they fall, they will receive a little help, and many who are not sincere will join them. He outlawed Antiochus Epiphanes. He outlawed the faithful practice of the Jewish religion. He murdered the faithful, slaughtering thousands. He violated the temple. The history books tell us that he desecrated the sacred temple in Jerusalem by dedicating it to the Greek god Zeus and sacrificing a pig there, which to the Jews was it's not only bad to sacrifice anything in the temple if you're not high priest sacrificing to God Almighty, to sacrifice a pig, an unclean animal, was terrible. An unclean animal to a false god. And this is what the text refers to as the abomination that causes desolation. But there was more ahead. From verse 36 on, things start to, to not quite fit with history as we know it. The events described don't really match anything that we know of in the life of Antiochus IV, especially since this leads into chapter 12 and, and starts talking about the end and the resurrection of the dead. We see that this hasn't happened yet. So it looks like when verse 36 mentions the king shall act as he pleases, it's not referring to Antiochus IV anymore, but to a king yet to come. A king like him, but worse. Someone in the same spirit. When Paul was writing to the Thessalonian church about the end and the return of Jesus, the same period that this prophecy is about, he wrote, As to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together with him, we beg you, brothers and sisters, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by spirit or by word, or by letter, as though from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord is already here. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first, and the lawless one is revealed, the one destined for destruction. He opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, declaring himself to be God. Do you not remember that I told you these things when I was still with you? And you know what is now restraining him, so that he may be revealed when his time comes. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, but only until the one who now restrains it is removed. And the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will destroy with the breath of his mouth, annihilating him by the manifestation of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is apparent in the work of Satan, who uses all power, signs, lying wonders, and every kind of wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. So what Paul is talking about is the return of Jesus and the end of this world. But he says that this mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Even back then in Paul's day, the evil that will reach its climax with the coming of this lawless one is already present in the world. The Jews could see that evil in Antiochus Epiphanes and it is that same kind of spirit that the lawless one will have. The spirit of arrogance and cruelty where a powerful human tries to lift himself up to the place of God. Just as in the Bible we have types, characters that foreshadow Christ we also have foreshadowing of the lawless one, the Antichrist. And so, we can look at the Bible, we can say that David, for example, is a foreshadowing of Christ. Jesus is like him, but better. And we can also look at characters like 
Antiochus Epiphanes and his self-exaltation and persecution of the people of God and see that the one who comes at the end will be like him, but worse. The lawlessness will reach a climax in one who tries to put himself in the place of God and then the end will come. The lawless one will be the opposite of Jesus, opposed to him. Instead of humbling himself like Jesus did, who took on the form of man even though he is God, the Antichrist will exalt himself. Although he is just a man, he will want to take the place of God. Instead of suffering for the sake of others, as Jesus did when he died on the cross to set us free, the lawless one will be the cause of suffering for his own benefit. And in all this, what are we to do? Even if the end is still centuries away, that spirit of lawlessness is still at work today, right now. So what are we to do? The lesson from Daniel, the whole book, and not just this bit at the end, the whole book speaks together. The lesson is that we are to remain faithful in a hostile world. We are to shine as lights in the darkness. We are to be faithful even through persecution. We are not to go along with the world. On the other side of this darkness is vindication for those who remain faithful. It says in verses 1 to 3 of chapter 12. At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. There will be a time of distress such as has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. The end will come. Resurrection will come. New life, the kingdom of God, will come in all its fullness, sweeping away the destructive powers of the, the brutal kingdoms of this world. Those who were wise, like the wise Daniel and his friends in Babylon, who remained faithful to God even when it seemed like all was lost. The temple was destroyed, the people were captive, they were taken from their home to live in a strange land among strange gods, they were threatened and persecuted for their faith, but they remained faithful, and that is our calling too. Those who keep their faith in the true King, your names have been written in God's book. You will not be forgotten. There is vindication for the faithful in the resurrection. The other side of this story is that some will be resurrected to everlasting contempt. Because we are eternal beings, we will go on forever. And in this life, you have the opportunity to decide what track you're taking. The question is, what direction will we go in? Will we go in the direction of the sinful spirit that the world leads us in? Or shall we go the way of Christ, the way of humility, of service, of grace? Shall we put our faith in Jesus even though by the world's standards it's a ridiculous thing to trust in the gruesome, humiliating death of a wandering peasant preacher? What a ridiculous, pathetic king the world says. Faith in him will become unpopular, ridiculed, and even dangerous, but there will be vindication for the faithful, everlasting life. We are exiles and dreamers in this world, like Daniel and his friends. We are out of place in a land of strange gods living by the standards of our true home, the kingdom of heaven. We believe things that go against the grain, against the standards of this world. And because of this, we feel the pressure to let go of these beliefs. You will feel pressure to conform, but stay faithful. No matter how dark it gets, there is life at the end of it all. Eternal life in the kingdom of the true King, Jesus Christ. And as we stay faithful, we will be an example to those around us. We will be like light shining in the darkness. And in doing so, we will draw people out of the darkness and into light, into eternal life in the true kingdom. That's our role in this world. It's heavy going, I you know, the, the end of 
Daniel was apocalyptic literature. Apocalyptic means it reveals the curtains being pulled back and we see these visions, we see angels, we see Gabriel, we see Michael, the angels, we see spiritual battles with powerful forces who exert influence over countries and cultures and kingdoms. And we find that we're in the middle of that battle and it is intimidating, perhaps. But we must remember who we belong to and remain faithful to our King, to Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father, help us to remain faithful and to do the things that help us to remain faithful, Lord, to, to read your word in a world full of the propaganda of the enemy. Let us read the truth. Let us listen to it. May we keep coming to you, Lord, in prayer. Protect us, Lord, we pray. Help us to be faithful. Help us to be gracious as you are gracious to us. May we never exalt ourselves over others. May we never try to take your place, Lord. Father, help us, we pray. Help us to believe your word and to live by it. Help us to be gracious, to show grace to others and to, to lead them out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we pray for your people all over the world. We pray for the church. We thank you, Lord, that things are getting a bit more like normal here in Ireland again. We can have Sunday school again. We can sit and we do not need to, to wear our masks if we don't want to uh, while, we seat, while we're seated. But Lord, we pray that it will continue to go well. And we pray that as we return to the things that we have done for years, we pray that we would not take them for granted. We pray that we would truly engage with them. We pray that we would um, be conscious of our blessings, Lord, and give thanks to you. Lord, we pray for our country and indeed the world that is still in the midst of a pandemic, we thank you that the effects of this variant of COVID are much less severe and life-threatening than previous strains. We pray, God, that it will continue to grow weaker, that antivirals and vaccines would um, continue to be developed, and that we will see this thing be no more of a, a worry than a common cold. Lord, we thank you that we have these resources. We thank you for the scientists and the medical professionals that have helped us to get this far. We thank you for all the people working together to sacrifice their comforts for the benefit of others. We thank you that we've seen that we are part of a community. And we pray, God, that the Ireland that emerges on the other side of this pandemic would be a kinder one. One that works together. We pray for those who are sick, that you heal them, Lord. And Lord, there has been a lot of damage done to people, a lot of trauma people have suffered over the last two years. And we're still realizing the extent of that. We pray that we would be gentle with those who have suffered, that we would comfort them, that you, Lord, would comfort them through us. We pray, God, that those who mourn would be comforted. We pray that as we continue to go through the ups and downs of life, that we would see that you're with us, that we would truly feel your presence with us, and that we would know that all of the darkness of this world is conquered in Christ. Or as we see um, international tensions in the news when we we realize that this world is still a world of beasts, of the powerful, the bullies, exerting their power on those who are not strong enough to stand up to them. And so we pray 
for peacemakers. We pray, God, that you raise up those who work for peace and that the leaders of this world would listen to them. We do not need to fight to help us to be peaceful, Lord. We pray for our community, our friends, our family, those whom we know. And you and your sovereignty have brought into our lives. We take a moment now to, to name them to you, ourselves, in silence. as much as we know these people, you know them better. And as much as we might love these people, you love them far more than we can imagine. And so we bring them to you in prayer now and we ask that you help them. We pray this and all our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen.